Spring officially arrived earlier today, and as has become the tradition here on Weather World, that means it's time to invite back with the changing of the seasons our resident astronomer, Dr. Chris Palma, from the Penn State Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. A special welcome to you this time, Chris, because it means spring is yeah. here. Yeah. So, you know, arguably, Chris, the biggest news of the last couple months, space-wise, was the launch, I think it was in February, of this mm -hmm. uh, SpaceX mm -hmm. rocket that infamously carried yeah. a Tesla into orbit. I've heard various stories about the orbit of this car that it one day might intersect the Earth. I mean, what's the deal here? Yeah. So I misunderstood it the first time I heard that, that they were gonna launch a car because I think some of the early press was, it's gonna go to Mars. And, and I think a lot of people think that this car is on its way to Mars. What they were trying to show was that the rocket was powerful enough to send something to Mars. So their plan was for it to leave Earth, get as far as Mars is, and now it's on an orbit that will intersect the orbit of Mars and intersect the orbit of Earth. And for anything that intersects our orbit, there's a <laughs> chance, but it's a very small one that it could potentially impact the Earth. Is this thing actually observable from Earth? I mean, why was it launched in the first place? Yeah, two very good questions. Uh, it, it is observable, and in fact, not long after the, the launch, some of my colleagues who, in the field, broadly speaking, who search for asteroids, use the type of telescopes that look for asteroids, and they were showing a, what's called a light curve, how the brightness of this object um, goes up and down. And so they've been able to show one, that it's observable, but two, that it's actually rotating. <laughs> so, so you see it, its brightness um, ebb and flow. Speaking, uh, speaking of launching things into space, I saw that the launch of the next great space telescope, I guess it's the successor to mm -hmm. Hubble, the James Webb Telescope, has been delayed yeah. again. Now, is this of concern to astronomers or just sort of kind of expected? <laughs> Both, <laughs> right, as always. It, it's a big concern because um, NASA missions have a budget, right? And, and you've probably heard before, NASA missions sometimes go over budget. And the longer it goes without launching, the more they're chewing up their, their budget. And so if, if it potentially um, goes too long, there's, there's a chance of cancellation. We do not want the James Webb Space Telescope to be canceled. Um, but at the same time, it is expected in the sense of at this stage where they're trying out everything on this incredibly large, incredibly sophisticated um, device, they know they're going to find small problems, so they build time into the schedule to address those, and the question is, can they address them without going too long, and we don't know the answer to that yet. Gotcha. So on a, on a somewhat smaller, much less expensive <laughs> scale, yeah. you told me that one of your colleagues is involved in what NASA calls a, a rocket sounding project. Mm -hmm. He's actually headed for the Marshall Islands mm -hmm. in the Pacific yes. to launch rockets. Yeah. Tell me about the science here. Yeah. Well, I want to talk about how this ties into things like James Webb Space Telescope. If you want to build a massive, multi-billion dollar space telescope, you want to use proven technology that we understand and we know can um, survive the rigors of space. And so how do we test that is by using much lower cost sounding rocket flights. So my colleague is building an instrument that is only going to be in space for five minutes. But in that five minutes, it will be in space, it will take data, and then once that, um, the, that new instrument lands back on Earth, they can test did it survive, and that technology is then potentially available for future space missions that are more expensive okay. and more sophisticated. So there's a recovery aspect to yes. this as well. Yeah. Um, one great aspect of astronomy, it's also somewhat true in meteorology, is you don't have to be a pro to enjoy mm -hmm. it, yeah. and even to make an interesting discovery. And I saw that an amateur astronomer has now been credited with the discovery of a supernova. Now, how mm -hmm. did that happen? So it, it's really nice that this ties into the James Webb Space Telescope discussion as well. So a telescope like James Webb, a multi-billion dollar instrument, can only see a small patch of sky at one time. And it only, it's only one telescope, so it can only see those small patches of sky um, in the amount of time it has. If you have lots and lots and lots of small telescopes that are observing the sky much more frequently, we use small telescopes to identify the targets that we follow up with the big telescopes. So amateur astronomers for years have been searching the sky looking for exploding stars, and there's just many more of them with many more telescopes, and if you get lucky, you find a supernova. Okay. In this case, what was really exciting, he caught this supernova in an earlier stage than even any professional astronomer <laughs> has caught a supernova. <laughs> so it was really an exciting uh, result. 
before we get you to tell us a little bit about what folks can see in the sky in the next month or so, uh, Stephen Hawking just passed away. Yeah. I mean, what will, I know it's hard to encapsulate yeah. this, but what will be his lasting legacy? You know, f for many people, it's probably his book, A Brief History of Time, but in the field of astronomy, you know, he's most well known for really trying to tackle some of the most um, interesting questions in uh, cosmology, the origin of the universe, and in black holes. And the thing that always comes to my mind is this idea of Hawking radiation. So he showed that black holes can actually evaporate, um, which is a, a really strange thing that, that um, no one would have thought would be possible before he, he came up with this idea. Very interesting. I remember buying A Brief History of Time back in the early 90s. So uh, in the next few weeks or months, tell us what we should be looking for in the sky. Yeah. I've said before that people should try to learn the stars, so I'm gonna give you a nice tip for this time of year. Um, hopefully you can find the Big Dipper in the sky, and you know that the Big Dipper has this nice curved tail. So what you can do is a, a little bit of star lore. You can do what's called follow the arc, and then you'll come to a bright star called Arcturus in Boudes. So you follow the arc to Arcturus, and then speed on to Spica. So you can look for the stars Arcturus and Spica in the constellations of Boudes and Virgo uh, around 10.30 at night tonight. By starting with the Big Dipper. Mm -hmm. Chris, always good to see you. Yeah, Happy spring. You. And we will be back in a moment with a recap of the short-range forecast.